Hi everyone, this lesson is on the signs and symptoms of cervical cancer. If you want more information on cervical cancer, please check out my full lesson on that topic. Before we get into the signs and symptoms, let's talk about what cervical cancer is. Cervical cancer is cancer of the cervix. And the cervix is actually the lower end of the uterus at the junction of the vagina. So here is the cervix and you can see that there is a cancer growing here and it can spread into surrounding structures leading to particular signs and symptoms and other findings we're going to talk about later on in this lesson. Cervical cancer is caused by human papillomavirus or HPV and there are specific types of HPV that increase the risk of getting cervical cancer. If you want more information, again, please check out my full lesson on that topic. And the risk factors for getting cervical cancer are related to risk factors for getting HPV. Again, please check out my full lesson for more information. Now, cervical cancer is a very common type of cancer. It's actually the third to fourth most common gynecological cancer worldwide, although it is more prevalent in developing countries compared to developed countries. The average age of onset of this cancer is 52 years old, and there has been declining rates of this type of cancer over the past few decades due to increased screening programs with pap smears. So again, for more information, please check out my full lesson on this topic. But the topic of this lesson is the signs and symptoms. And in fact, cervical cancer can cause a variety of signs and symptoms, and we're going to talk about those signs and symptoms and why they occur in the next upcoming slides. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of cervical cancer. Before we actually get into the signs and symptoms, it's important to note that many cases of cervical cancer are going to be detected with screening methods like pap smear and colposcopy. So a lot of times patients may have a very early stage of cervical cancer, but they may have no symptoms at all, which means that they would be asymptomatic. So some cases of cervical cancer can be asymptomatic, meaning that they have no symptoms at all. But if they do have signs and symptoms, the most important finding or the most important sign of cervical cancer and oftentimes the first sign of cervical cancer is abnormal vaginal bleeding. So abnormal vaginal bleeding is again one of the most common and early signs of cervical cancer if not the first sign. It often starts with postcoital bleeding meaning that after intercourse, the patient will experience vaginal bleeding. So this is oftentimes going to be the first time patients will notice this abnormal vaginal bleeding. Over time though, this abnormal vaginal bleeding will become more frequent and spontaneous as the disease progresses. This will show up as heavy menstrual bleeding. So menstrual bleeding or patient's period will become heavier. They may also have intermenstrual bleeding, meaning that there is bleeding, spotting, or heavier bleeding between periods. Or if a woman is postmenopausal, if they have postmenopausal bleeding, that is going to be abnormal vaginal bleeding as well. So you can imagine the reason why this occurs is that if there is a growing cancer on the cervix, the cervix can become eroded ulcerated from the cancer and cause bleeding to be found. In. Another important finding in cervical cancer is vaginal discharge. So vaginal discharge is again one of the first signs of cervical cancer. It's often again going to be found early on in the disease course. What will be noted is that the vaginal discharge will often start out as a watery discharge and then will later on become more red to brown in coloration. It can also become malodorous, meaning that it can smell or have a funny smell to it. And it's due to the inflammatory process that is going on within the cervix due to the growing cancer. So this is also an important finding with cervical cancer as well. Other important symptoms of cervical cancer include vaginal discomfort. So vaginal discomfort is going to be either pain, discomfort, or irritation. This can be found with pain during intercourse as well. So this would be known as dyspareunia. So this can be a finding of cervical cancer. So if there's dyspareunia and then postcoital bleeding, this can be findings in a cervical cancer. And you can imagine the reason why this occurs is because the cancer starts to spread. It starts to extend past the cervix into the vagina. And this can lead to pain, irritation, and discomfort. Pelvic pain can also be another finding in cervical cancer. This is going to be an unexplained pelvic pain. So if there's another explanation, that doesn't mean that the pelvic pain is due to cervical cancer. So this is oftentimes going to be an unexplained pelvic pain. And this is going to be due to the cancer spreading into the surrounding areas impinging on local nerves. So again, that cancer starts to extend out past the cervix and enter into the pelvic wall and impinge on some of the surrounding structures in the pelvis. 
Cervical cancer patients can also have back pain. So as the cancer spreads and it increases in size, it starts to extend into other areas, there can be unexplained back pain. So again, it's going to be unexplained. So it's not going to be due to some musculoskeletal injury. It's going to be an unexplained back pain. And again, this is going to be due to the cancer extending into or past the true pelvis. Dysuria is also another finding in cervical cancer in some patients. So a lot of these findings we're going to talk about are going to be in later stages of the disease when the cancer has spread. So dysuria is a burning sensation while urinating. So this burning sensation while urinating is going to be or could be due to the cancer impinging on the bladder itself or on the urethra. So if there's something pushing on the bladder or the urethra and when an individual urinates, there can be some burning from that, from that impingement. So again, these findings, including back pain and dysuria, are going to be findings that occur later on in the disease, so in later stages of the disease. So most commonly, a patient will experience abnormal vaginal bleeding and vaginal discharge before they have some of these other findings, including back pain and dysuria, and the other findings we're going to talk about here in a moment. And some of those include urinary retention, So urinary retention is a difficulty initiating urination, disrupted urine stream, or a complete inability to urinate. So a patient feels that they have to urinate. They try, but there's some difficulty initiating urination. Or when they get started, there's some disruption of the urine stream. It's not a steady stream. Or there's a complete inability to urinate at all. So a patient may be completely obstructed in their ability to urinate. So that would be complete urinary retention. And this is due to the cancer compressing surrounding structures, including the urethra. So we talked about dysuria being a case where the cancer may be compressing the urethra, but in the case of urinary retention, this may be a complete compression of the urethra. So the patient may not be able to urinate at all. Constipation can also occur in patients with cervical cancer in later stages of the disease. So constipation is going to be reduced frequency of defecation or increased consistency of stool. And patients may also have obstipation, meaning that they don't pass any flatus at all. And this would be due to a bowel obstruction. So as the cervical cancer grows and extends and starts to compress on the large intestine, this can cause constipation and in some cases may even lead to a bowel obstruction. So lead to the patient having obstipation. Now there are some other complications of metastasis of the cervical cancer. A lot of the previous findings we talked about are going to be due to increased extension of the cervical cancer into surrounding areas, but there can be even more extension into particular areas that lead to particular findings. And these include the following. Leg edema. So leg edema is a swelling of the legs due to accumulation of interstitial fluid. So there's increased fluid in the interstitial area. So what's supposed to happen is that the fluid in the interstitial area is supposed to be drained by the lymphatics. But if there is a growing cancer in the pelvis, This can lead to compression on lymphatic drainage in the pelvis, meaning that the flow of lymph or drainage of the fluid is impeded. So this can lead to a buildup of fluid in the legs. So this can lead to leg edema. We can also see pain, and this is going to again be back pain we talked about before. And we can also see hydronephrosis. Hydronephrosis is going to be a condition where there is fluid buildup around the kidney. And this condition of hydronephrosis is going to be due to compression on urinary outflow or urinary retention. So if the cancer from the cervix begins to compress on one of the ureters, this can lead to compression of the ureter and lead to a hydrourethra. So the kidney will continue to make urine, but if there is a compression on one of the ureters, that urine cannot pass that obstruction, leading to a backup of the urine in the ureter, leading to hydrourethra, and eventually that urine will back up into the kidney itself, leading to hydronephrosis. In the case where the cervical cancer actually impinges or completely compresses the urethra, leading to urinary retention, this can lead to a patient having a full bladder. They're not able to urinate. If they're not able to actually clear that obstruction, their kidneys, again, continue to make urine. So both kidneys will continue to make urine, but if they have nowhere to go, if that urine has nowhere to go, the urine starts to back up into the ureters again, causing hydrourethra on both sides and bilaterally and lead to 
fluid accumulation or that urine being accumulated in the kidney leading to hydronephrosis bilaterally. So those are two ways that hydronephrosis can occur in cervical cancer. All three of these findings are a triad indicating pelvic wall involvement. So this is something that can be helpful in determining pelvic wall involvement if you see leg edema, back pain, and hydronephrosis. These are a triad indicating pelvic wall involvement. And the next signs are going to be signs that are noted when a clinician actually visibly looks at or examines the cervix. So there are visible abnormalities on the cervix that can be found in patients with cervical cancer because there is a cancer that is going to be growing on the cervix. So oftentimes what can be noted is that the cervix itself can be friable, can have redness, and there can be some ulcerations. So these are some key words or findings or descriptions of a cervix that has a cancerous growth or cancer tissue developing on it. So this would be something that a physician or a clinician may see when they are examining the cervix. But again, not all cases of cervical cancer will have these visible abnormalities. There may be a very early case that is detected by pap smear, so there would be a case of cervical cancer that shows no abnormality. So again, that can also be important because a lot of times there may be no symptoms, so asymptomatic, but there may also be no signs on the cervix as well, especially if detected early on with pap smear. If you want to learn more about cervical cancer, please check my full lesson on this topic. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.